Grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a joy to welcome you here to Blacksburg United Methodist Church on our Church Street campus. Uh, my name is Brad Delaney. I'm the lead pastor here. And along with Pastor Jennifer Fletcher, we want to welcome you to this time of online worship, uh, especially if you're joining us perhaps uh, as a, a, someone who's new, as a guest. We are honored that you're with us. And we pray that you'll be blessed through the service today. If you take a moment to click over to our guest registration form, we would love it if you could connect with us so that we could uh, build a relationship with you. Plus, we have a, a gift we'd like to share with you as a first-time guest among us. So please take a moment to do that. Holy Week is coming up in several weeks. That's the time when we remember Jesus' last events before his death and resurrection. A part of our Holy Week remembrances is on Good Friday, we will be unveiling a virtual Stations of the Cross, which is a way for us using artwork produced by the members of our church to tell the story of Jesus's final hours leading up to his crucifixion. We'd encourage you, if you haven't signed up, to please take a moment to sign up for this. The deadline for submissions will be Thursday, March the 25th. This is going to be a beautiful way for us to express our love and devotion for Christ and this Good Friday in a virtual way. So I encourage you, make use of those God-given talents that we have to share the story of Christ's death in art. Friends, we are excited about the upcoming Holy Week and Easter worship opportunities. And so I'd like to share these with you. We'll be offering both outdoor in-person worship opportunities and virtual worship services. You will need to pre-register for any outdoor in-person worship opportunity and the Zoom service of Holy Communion that will be held on Maundy Thursday. And you can pre-register by visiting the link in the chat, which links to our website. So on Holy Thursday, which is April 1st, we will have a Zoom service of Holy Communion at 7 p.m. And we will have an in-person drive-in service of Holy Communion at 5.30 p.m. here in the parking lot on the Church Street campus. On Good Friday, we will premiere a virtual worship opportunity on the Blacksburg UMC YouTube channel. And on Easter, we have three opportunities. One is a virtual worship service, which will premiere at 11 a.m. Another is an, our traditional Easter sunrise service, which will happen at 6.45 a.m. at the Hill on the Blacksburg Municipal Golf Course. And we will also have a drive-in, in-person worship service at the Southgate lot, lot three on the campus of Virginia Tech at 11 a.m. on Easter Sunday. Friends, there are so many ways to connect in worship during Holy Week and Easter, and I look forward to sharing in them with you. Please join me in the call to worship. You can participate with the words in bold as they appear on your screen. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Amen. Friends, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, when I am hurried, anxious, lonely, dealing with the latest interruptions stuck in my head, and so tired that I crash at the end of the day, you find me there. Because you, Holy One, are almighty, but not too high and lofty to meet me in the particulars of my day. Instead, you transform these harried moments into invitations to draw closer to you, to find clarity, peace, presence, to encounter the holy. During this Lenten season, train my eyes to catch a glimpse of your everyday divinity in each moment of each day. Amen.
Good morning, friends. Coming to you on this rainy morning, and I wanted to talk to you about rain and really rainbows. Um, there is a poem that I really like um, by a poet named Ann Weeds, and it's called Walking Rainbows. Now, I know that might sound silly. You might think, how can a rainbow walk? Um, but it's about how we are rainbows. We are rainbows that walk around in the world. It talks about oh, us listen. being rainbows that walk around. And what it says is rainbows are not just pretty colors and they're not just the end of a storm, but they are God's heart saying to us that we should be rainbows that walk around reminding people that we belong to God and that he keeps his promises. And what do you think that means, that God keeps his promises? Well, God, um, when he made the first rainbow, remember that story with the big flood and then that big, beautiful rainbow, God's rainbow, was a sign of his promise that rain wouldn't last forever. And rain in that story is a kind of a symbol also in our lives of hard times. So it's a reminder when we see a rainbow that hard times won't last forever. So if we're going to be walking rainbows for God, then we can help others know that hard times won't last forever. So I wonder if there's someone in your life that you know that's going through a hard time. Maybe they're struggling at school. Maybe going back to school full-time has been really hard on them and challenging. Or maybe they're having some other troubles that they've shared with you. Um, maybe something else is going on in their life. Maybe if they just had a hard day. Um, how can you be a reminder to them that this isn't going to last forever? How can you be a walking rainbow? Can you encourage them in some way? Can you just listen to them um, and be a good friend? Can you be some kind of reminder that you're there for them as a friend and that this isn't gonna last forever? I want to show you. I want to show you this beautiful rainbow colored necklace that I'm wearing that one of the special people in my life made for me a while ago. And I wear it on rainy days sometimes, like today. I decided to pull it out because it was rainy and it just gives me a little burst of happiness. And it was a way um, of this person encouraging me when they made it for me. Um, so that's another thing that you might do um, for a friend of yours. Be a walking rainbow. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your reminder that you keep your promises that hard times won't last forever. Thank you for the re reminder through the rainbow. Amen. On Monday, March 8th, the Gunnar Talman Sunday School class delivered 84 Carol Lee donuts to the faculty and staff at Margaret Beeks Elementary School. 
This is just one way that we are living into our partnership with our friends at Margaret Beaks. And all of this is possible because of your generosity. Friends, I want to invite you at this time to make your um, gift to the work of God through Blacksburg United Methodist Church. You can do so by visiting the link in the chat and giving online, or by stopping by the church office this week and dropping off a check. We are so grateful for your support of the ministry of Blacksburg United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for all the ways that you are at work through the people of Blacksburg United Methodist Church. And we ask that you would bless these gifts that are given, that they would multiply the ministry of your kingdom in our community and beyond. We ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning. The scripture lesson today comes from Mark 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right. Teacher, you have truly said that he is one and besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one another's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God and that no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. As a part of my morning prayer time with God after reading scripture and doing devotional readings, I'll usually spend 20 minutes in what's called centering prayer. It's a period of silence in which I just really sit and open myself to God's presence and, and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and do work within my being. The technique is really quite simple, to just be still in God's presence. Whenever I start to engage with a thought, I'm to return to what's called a centering word, a word that refocuses my energy from my head, my thoughts, into my heart, my being. Ideally, you wouldn't have lots of thoughts, but that's not really how it happens. I recorded an actual centering prayer session to just give you a sense of what this looks like. I can see myself walking into the Kroger Fuel Center convenience store, looking over the snacks, the guy behind the counter scanning my selection through the glass. I, I wonder, why on earth is he locked behind that glass? I, I guess it's come in helpful during COVID. Oh, ah, wait, I'm praying. Centering word, back to the centering word. I'm totally stuck about my sermon this week. I mean, every idea about how I should start it just doesn't seem like the right one. Oh, I, I know, I've got it. I could start the sermon by showing people how I get caught up in my thoughts during the centering prayer. Oh, daggone it, I've gone and done it again. Back to the centering word. Back to the centering word. What is that? Oh, I see myself approaching the coffee shop. I wonder if they're open. Yes, the open sign is on. I, I walk through the door. Coffee! Oops, I did it again. Back to the centering word. The centering word. I wanted to share this with you because it happens not only during my prayer time, it happens just when I'm living life. You know, I'll be driving in the car with my children, I'll be having dinner with my wife, having conversation with someone at work, when all of a sudden, boom, my mind is someplace else. Now, I may be there, but not entirely. I can have these moments when I get so stuck inside my own head that I cannot really be fully present to God or to the people or to the world around me. You know, I suspect many of us struggle with the same. We sometimes get so caught up in our own thoughts that it really causes us problems. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're maybe taking in a lecture or listening to a song or a movie or maybe even having a conversation with someone when all the while our mind is spinning with judgment and critique, or, or we're maybe building the argument against what this person is saying, or we're rehearsing our response to what we're hearing. We're so focused on our internal thoughts that we've never really even truly heard what our conversation partner is bringing. It's how many of us were trained, honestly, as academics. We're, we're to critique and to poke holes in other people's arguments. Many of us have had those moments when we're so stuck in our heads that we even lose track with where the other person is in the conversation, what they're talking about, and you get caught up in your thoughts, and the next thing you realize is, oh my gosh, I don't even know what this person's talking about anymore, leading to really embarrassing moments. But those moments are nothing compared with the really tragic moments when being stuck in our head really equates to being truly disengaged from the people around us. Like when our mind is swirling with problems that we're dealing with at work and we miss out on an opportunity to really connect with a spouse or a significant other or, or a child. 
or when our mind is swirling with some new insight or epiphany, so much so that we're oblivious to the need of a friend or a neighbor who's right there in front of us, or when our minds are just abuzz with negativity, with judgments and critical thoughts about other people or even about ourselves. And, and here's the tragic part of it. It stifles the flow of love. Because every one of us has had that experience. You know what I'm talking about. When you're speaking with someone and you know they are not there with you. <laughs> and you'd had something really important to say or maybe you needed to share some burden but that person is way too caught up in their own head to really even notice that you're there. You feel anything but love. You don't wanna be that kind of person and neither do I. But let's confess it, sometimes we are and we struggle to change that about ourselves. Our head can be so into the clouds that our feet are not firmly on the ground and our hearts not present to the people around us. We may even find ourselves helpless to change these deep ruts that have cut their ways into the neural pathways of our minds. How can we be freed of the tyranny of thought without becoming mindless? How can we become more fully present to the people around us? How might we be liberated from our heads without losing our minds so that we can love more fully? I want to talk about someone who knew how to love freely and love fully. We look no further than Jesus Christ. You know, he refused to live his life in his head. He walked on this earth wholeheartedly as a human being. When we approach today's story here in Mark's gospel, Jesus is on the heels of this extended debate with various religious and philosophical teachers. It's like a a bunch of public debates between Jesus and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, chief priests, the elders, the scribes. They were debating Jesus' authority as a rabbi, these legal quibbles about paying taxes, philosophical curiosities about whether or not people in the resurrection were actually still married. Now, honestly, these were all head trips, intellectual debates that kept people stuck in their minds. But Jesus wants to move things from the head and into the heart instead. And one of the scribes, he created a perfect opportunity for Jesus to do this. He comes and he hears them disputing with one another. And he seems really interested in getting at the heart of things. Surprised and impressed with how Jesus responds to them, he says to Jesus, which commandment is the greatest of them all? Wow. Now, this is not a minor theological quibble. It's like asking Siri, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> Apparently, this question of the greatest commandment was hotly debated in a first century Judaism. Jesus responds with words that are not unfamiliar to you and me. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second Jesus says it's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, it's a curiosity that Jesus here lists four ways in which we are to love God he adds in something that's not in Deuteronomy, the word mind. Jesus emphasizes that we can love God with our intellect. And Deuteronomy in the Old Testament leaves that out. Now, sure, we can love God with our mind, but the fact that it's not in Deuteronomy says to me that perhaps it's not one of the greatest ways in which we love God. In other words, when it comes to loving God with our mind, maybe it's something we should kind of hold loosely. And I gotta be honest, as someone who has a master of divinity, who loves theological arguments and debates uh, and finds those very life-giving, that's a little bit of a challenge for me to consider, yes, Jesus said we are to love God with our mind, but it's not in Deuteronomy. It's 
maybe there are other ways in which we are called to love God. And something else interesting here is the word strength. Love God with all your strength. You know, we tend to think of loving as something we might do with our mind and with our heart, our soul, or our being. But our bodies? Now, here's the truth. Our heart, our soul, our mind, where are those located? Ta-da! In our bodies. Jesus and the law of the Old Testament are making clear for us something that when we love God with all that we have and all that we are, we are made whole as human beings. That's what we are created for. In other words, we love God with everything we have and everything that we are. Mind, heart, body. You know, it's been said that the longest journey you will ever take is the 18 inches from your head to your heart. The 18 inches from your head to your heart. Now, when I talk to you about the heart, we're not talking about emotion, mushy, warm, fuzzy stuff here. Biblically, the heart is the seat of intention. From the heart, we do evil things, and from the heart, we do good. From the heart, we forgive others. From the heart, we find the courage to act boldly and take risks. And it's interesting, the heart is the core of our body. In other words, you cannot speak of the heart apart from your body. In other words, when I come to my heart, I come to the center of who I am. This, friends, is a key that I think can liberate us when we're struggling with being stuck in our heads. God is inviting us to make this journey, and I think inviting us through Jesus Christ to do that, this journey where we descend to the heart space where we find our grounding. I don't know if you ever noticed our heads are the furthest thing from the ground. You know, it's the part of us that wants to reach for the heavens, to do things like build towers to the heavens. Too often the mind gets filled with things that are a little too grand for us, that take us to what is essentially a very self-centered place, we talk about head trips, right? Head trips is where we inflate our own ego, our own importance, where we get really concerned about being right, about me winning my argument, about me having the truth, about me coming out on top. Jesus invites his disciples to divest themselves of ego, to let that go, to instead of being right, Jesus invites us to be righteous, to be holy. That's what John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist movement, called sanctification. Being made perfect, not morally, not ethically, being made perfect, Wesley said, in love. God's grace working in our hearts such that we know God's love and we freely share God's love more and more. Jesus described it as the downward path of descent, of emptying ourselves, taking up the cross and following him. Taking up our cross means having our feet beneath us such that we, we can show up in the world to people who are hungry, who are hurting, who are longing for presence, enabling us to show up in this world and love freely. It's interesting, uh, at the end of the story, Jesus says to the scribe, you know, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far. He gets it here, but he's not quite there yet. While he may get it here, he maybe hasn't quite gotten it yet here. He hasn't yet moved from the head trip of believing to really walking with Jesus. Jesus, you see, invites people to follow him. The disciples' path is more than just an intellectual ascent or a belief in his teachings. 
You're not far off, Jesus says. Yes, you might get it here, but you're maybe not quite there yet. Because following Jesus means actually moving our feet, taking our bodies out into the world, into different places and spaces where Jesus is present, where Jesus leads us, and that's more than head knowledge. We are taken to places where we are uncomfortable, where we are asked to take risks, to find that courage that comes from our heart, where we are asked to show up because we love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. <laughs> How might you do this? How might you and I grow more able to show up and to follow? How might you be freed from your head and move to the heart instead? Well, I think a first and a, an obvious way is to simply take care of your body. It's a part of what God gave us. It's how we move in this world. So get exercise. Feed your body a healthy diet. Get adequate rest. Stay hydrated. I am preaching to myself, friends. Yeah, you know, there are sometimes when things happen to our bodies beyond our control, but we should never be fatalistic about our health physically. Paul in the scriptures describe our bodies as temples for the Holy Spirit. That literally our bodies are a dwelling place for God in this world. What a beautiful thing your body is. Made in God's image. And when you don't feel well physically, when you're sick or you're just not healthy, you know, it impacts every part of who you are. Your, your mind, your heart, your spirit. So first, take care of that body of yours. And, and secondly, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, put down your phone. Limit your screen time. I mean, literally, sometimes we just need to take these things and set them down. Maybe you create holy space around the dinner table where you just check the phones and don't bring them to the table. Or maybe it's at bedtime. Uh, or maybe you're tempted first thing in the morning to pick up that phone and check things out. Maybe that's not the best time to do that. Put that phone aside because here's what I find happens. When you are stuck <laughs> in your phone, and when you are doing this, you are stuck in your head. You are not present to the people around you. So first, care for your body. Secondly, put down the phone. And thirdly, come into your body as a spiritual practice. That may seem like an oxymoron. <laughs> your body as a spiritual practice but here's the thing, when you find yourself stuck in your head, you need to do things to help reconnect with your body and your heart. I found for myself both the centering prayer practice that is a struggle for me and yoga to be very helpful in bringing me into touch with my body and God's presence in my body, paying attention to the Holy Spirit and what God's Spirit may be telling me throughout the day as I learn to pay attention to that gut intuition. But I realize things like centering prayer or yoga, it's not gonna be for everyone. I wanna share with you a video through our online Lenten toolkit that can help you learn how to engage your body just in small day-to-day -day moments. I'll lead you through a very brief centering exercise that you can use in your day and moments when you find yourself really stuck in your head. It's the simplest thing that you can do to, when your head's floating up and carrying you away someplace else to just take a deep breath. Feel the air filling your lungs, your feet on the ground, and return to your heart space, which is where God dwells. Because when you find your mind keeping you in bondage, friends, you do have a choice. Do I stay stuck in my head or do I move into my heart instead? The, the scribe who came to Jesus, he was so close. You know, he got it here. But he didn't actually make the decision to follow, 
to make it a heart thing, to give feet to his faith. You are not far from the kingdom of God, Jesus said to him. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to just be not far from getting this, not far from the kingdom of God. I don't want to just be not far from my liberation. I want my life to be one where people see in me, in my face, in my presence, the love of God who I have come to know through Jesus Christ. I want to show you what it can look like when you're willing to move from that head and make that 18-inch journey into the heart without losing our minds. Last week, a longtime member of our church, Lou Talbot, came by here at the church office to see Pastor Jennifer and me. Now, I'd spoken with Lou on the phone several times before, and, and I'd heard other people talk about Lou, and it was a real delight, though, to meet her in person. It reminded me of the power of our physical presence. I could tell while physically she was probably greatly diminished from who she had used to be, I could still tell there was a power to this person, a strong mind, a keen intellect. But also, I could tell Lou Talbot was fully present from the moment I walked into the room where she was. I sensed in her this gracious and warm hospitality, a welcoming in her presence. I gotta be honest, I was shocked as many of you are by her sudden death last weekend. Someone shared on our social media a, a video from a few years back in which Lou talked about why she gave of her time and her treasures. And she concluded the video by describing what it looks like when we freely give and I thought it was fascinating that she talked about from the heart. Have a look. The first thing I gave to the church was my heart. As a child, I didn't have any money to give. I gave my heart and I was blessed. Then I gave my time. And after that, it's important to give money, but the money is based on our ability to give. And ask the question, if you look at your tax statement, can somebody know that you're a Christian based on your balance sheet? The other thing that's important about giving is the greatest gifts are free. Love and kindness cost us nothing, and we should just be pouring that out. <laughs> and we're not. We were stingy with our hugs. We're stingy with saying nice things to people. That's all free. So you give away the free stuff, and I think you get in the habit of giving and the habit grows, and then you give more and more as you're able. Friends, Lou's obituary was published today, and I have to say I'm moved when I see all the ways in which her life has impacted this world. The habit of giving she talked about, it grows as God's love pours more into our hearts. And as it pours into our hearts, our physical being, that love flows through us when we show up in this world, much as Lou did, with our whole being. You know, when we're caught up in our heads, the love, the grace, the mercy, it just gets stuck, just like we get stuck in our heads. And as Lou said, we can start to get stingy. <laughs> but when we show up in the world, with our whole selves, heart, soul, mind, body, knowing and trusting that we are loved by God, that God is fully present in us and around us, then the grace of God flows through us to the people around us. And by the Spirit of Christ growing within us, you and I become the kind of people who are at home in our own skin, who are tender and gracious with ourselves, and, by extension, tender and gracious with everyone else that we encounter. We become the kind of people in whose presence others sense God's presence. People who welcome each one we encounter, who, who listen with our heart to what others say to us, who become a healing balm 
for people who are hurting, who just want someone in this world to slow down long enough to hear them and to see them, in whose presence others feel genuinely and generously loved. You know, it's not up for us to make ourselves this way. <laughs> the beautiful good news is it's God's grace flowing through us heart, soul, mind, body, helping to soften us over the years to become those whose lives reflect more and more the love that we have received through Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may it be so in us. Amen. Friends, as we go to the Lord in prayer, let us remember all of those who are receiving medical care. Don Musser, Jim Montgomery, Megan Donald Hughes. And let us also remember those who are in a season of grief. Today we lift up the family of Lou Talbot, who died on March 13th. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Healing God, we lift up to you this morning all of those who are receiving medical care. We ask that you would meet them at their place of need and bring comfort and healing and hope. And Lord, we lift up those who are in a season of grief, especially the family of Lou Talbot. God, we ask that you would comfort them in the ways that only you can. And Lord, we ask that you give us the grace to focus on what is most important, loving you and loving others with everything we've got. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Friends, as you go forth into this week, go in peace. And when you find yourself stuck in your head, may God grant you the grace to focus on what is most important. Amen. Thank you.